Any questions or comments for Stacy? So here today for 196 thousand for the yes for the department as a total yes um and where would it be with all of where should it be what, um, which, what's normal what what would you right now we we should be in in the black right now we're in the red and all of that is all of the the expenses for the feasibility study are through my department budget like they've all been paid for through my department instead of a loan or some other outside of my department financials um it's all been allocated and paid for through my budget and so that's additional expenses above just operating so we've got permission to borrow money from the county but we haven't done that yet correct yes i received um loan a loan um back when we were we approved the feasibility study of up to three hundred thousand, and then i went back for an additional eighty five thousand. Um, and that loan hasn't been utilized yet. So that's why our expenses are so high because the majority of that is the feasibility study and then the additional long-term care and closure payment that was made. I can go back. Um, yeah, so on, um, so the long-term care and closure, I had budgeted 80,000 for that. We ended up paying an additional Eighty-five thousand, or excuse me, seventy-five thousand into the long-term care and closure because those investments didn't generate any interest last year um, to to put us back in compliance on our long-term care and closure. Um, the engineering you see here is at one hundred and thirty-three thousand nine hundred seventy dollars, and a majority of that is feasibility study work. No, no. The long-term closure and that money has been put someplace else so it is collecting interest yes that one hundred and fifty five thousand dollars was paid into people's state bank into that escrow account which is starting to generate interest i did send you guys um with my budget information on saturday the long-term care and closure projections um as well as the balances of those accounts that i received from people's state bank Any questions? Is there enough money in that long-term care and closure to carry us for a, a forty-year period? It's you said? forty year. It's projected. It's the it's a forty-year period, and that is what the DNR projects it will cost us to maintain that for forty years. Is it realistic? I don't believe the DNR thinks so. So um, are we short? To them, no. We are in compliance real, right now. Realistically, are we going to have enough money there? I can't say for certain. It depends on what future costs do. Um, for what the DNR is wanting us to contribute every year with our investment that we already have in there, we should theoretically be making money instead of having to contribute money to that fund now. Yeah, that, that spreadsheet that I sent you, is there because as that account sits there, it should be generating interest every year. And they're only, I can't remember, I think they're using like a 2% rate um, for the whole, for that entire period. Um, and just because the DNR says 40 years, like it may be longer, like that is their their estimate. Your closure. Yes, please. How it's, Every periodically, there's a statutory requirement every, every 10 years, but they go back and revisit this periodically to up the cost for the worst case closure scenario. So that you put money aside so that that should you walk away or somebody walk away, that you have the ability to close the money. The long-term care is projected out 40 years. And what they do is they say, okay, 2022 cost, this is what it would cost right now. And then they have an assumed inflation factor so every year they have to adjust actual inflation with respect to interest and i think that's what you're talking about is that due to inflation they didn't keep up with the amount of interest you're accruing on the account so you have to make the adjustment so that hypothetically that continues to grow as inflation grows or as you you know cost of living increases year to year the obligation to the state is you assume 40 years based off of the requirements currently in place. But what we see commonly um, 
with buy-in from the DNR is that, let's say you get into your 20th, 30th year, the amount of monitoring that is necessary starts to decrease um, because you're demonstrating, hey, there's not an issue, we can reduce some of the monitoring requirements. And that one includes um, gas extraction and other things. So, you know, the DNR is flexible with that because they know, because you really never walk away from the requirement to monitor it. I mean, they, they require 40 years, but it's really a responsibility and perpetuity until you can demonstrate that there's not an issue. And typically that occurs before the 40 year period starts and they allow you to start really significantly reducing that water monitoring or it's about reaching organic stability in the landfill. Does that help at all? Or? So, I mean, in most instances, the fund is health because you start with the baseline amount of money that they agree on, but it's really a fluctuation that they primarily to do with the economy that you have to make adjustment for inflation and what you're actually getting the interest within your investment. Thank you. Okay, got that settled. Feasibility study update. All right, and um, for those of you that um, may not have met Brian. Brian Kent from SEH is here to um, give an update on the feasibility study and their report. Hi. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to give an update. Um, today, uh, the feasibility study report for the expansion, proposed expansion, will be gets, being sent. Hard copies, electronic copies will be sent as well to the DNR. Um, copies of the reports will be going to the clerks in all towns. Vernon County um, and the local library as well as to the several DNR representatives. So that will go through um, and that'll also be at some point, um, it'll be on the DNR's website. We have to provide it to them so that you can provide access and provide comments through their website. So it'll be up there. But if anybody needs a copy, um, it's big, it's 2,000 pages. Um, I mean, that would have to come through you, the county, but we could provide it electronically, certainly, but it's going to be a huge file. Do you know what the time frame is from the time that you submit it to the DNR to the time they actually put it on their website? So if I have someone that submits a request for it, I could say, you know, it'll be posted on the DNR's website with a six months each time frame. Typically, it doesn't take long. I, I can check with them on that. Um, the time frame of the approval of the review process is that once the DNR has it in hand and once they have the invoice paid for the feasibility review, they have 65 days to issue a notice of completeness. Um, and at that point, um, once it, it goes through, the, deter the DNR have determined it to be complete, then they have 60 days to approve it. Now there's a couple other things that go in there. In my 30 years, I've never seen one go through the DNR without a notice of incompleteness. They want some additional information. If every time that happens, um, that pauses that 65 day review until they have the information that they need. Um, so that ultimately in the cumulative days of their review waiting for the information is 65. Once they get that notice of the completion, then they post a public notice. Once it's determined to be complete, they'll publish a a notice to folks saying, hey, you have 30, 30 days to provide comments. Um, so, you know, during that process, um, once the notice of completion is approved, then they have 60 days to issue feasibility of the board. You know. So that's the timing of it. Um, the, the results of the feasibility largely were um, not a surprise. That shows that it is technically feasible environmentally feasible and it's deep. Um, so, you know, I would encourage people that are to, to look at it to figure out any specific details you're of interest on, but it's all spelled out. It's very comprehensive. So, right now it's kind of more of a waiting game to hear back from the game. Um, That's a specific question. Yeah, you said it pauses the 65 day. Does it pause or does it restart the clock? It pauses it. Positive. Okay. So let's say they you issue them, they take 15 days to issue a letter of notice of completeness. 15 days goes on the clock. Once they get the information, they have 45 days, or excuse me. Oh, okay. Days. 
And the DNR does the, the time accounting. I, I never quite understood it because their calculations are always different than mine, but it's all kind of within the same realm. Well, the quicker we get information back to them after they ask it, the, the quicker the process goes. Right. So that's what we do. We, we, we work with the DNR as well, saying, you know, if it's something that doesn't necessarily, if you want an email, I can answer this in an email or something that doesn't require, you know, a, a detailed effort or, a, you know, exhaustive effort to find the information, then it's oftentimes just address it with an email or something to keep the client alone. And I know right now the DNR is um, understaffed. We do have designated folks within the department uh, for the review, but they've led employees for the last eight, 10 months pretty bad. So I know they're short staffed. So um, my experience has been lately that they take the time they need as opposed to getting it out quickly. Okay. And I'm not getting into technical details, but if you have technical questions, I'll answer them the best I can. Um, I may need to default some of the more technical questions to our experts. Feel free to. Does anybody have any questions here in the audience for Brian? I guess I would just like to know, could we just get a copy of that site address so we could look at it? I don't know where to What go. I can do is I'll, I'll probably get this afternoon and I'll send an electronic copy. Because it's so big, what we use as a SharePoint file. So you can go in there and access and download it um, when it's uploaded to the DNR's website. And I'm not exactly sure when that'll go right. be posted. They'll break it into probably about 50 different pieces so that you can open them up. Right. The figures themselves, the drawings are probably 70, 80 meg. But I believe the entire report itself is close to 160. Yeah, if we can just get the location of it, then we don't have yeah, to. Yeah, I'll provide access to the SharePoint site so the people And we can provide files or whatever. Could you give an example of what technically not feasible or environmentally not feasible? You just said that it technically and environmentally is feasible as a sort of summary report. Can you just, as an example, say the things of bedrock within 10 feet of your liner, proposed liner? be something that would be um, potentially perceived as not feasible or something you'd have to engineer through. Presence of groundwater with the liner. Presence of geology that is not stable. If there were potentially Necessary takes of environmental species, endangered species, if there were archaeological resources that would be in danger. And there's a number of things that. that so, the definition of technically feasible is those short lists that you just gave as examples of all been studied and right. therefore, and they don't. They we, that's that. part of the study, and that we, sh we show that we give a detailed explanation of the geology, the hydrogeology, to environmental review. DNR does an environmental review, so at least archaeological species. It's a detailed review of existing groundwater quality. I came back showing that the existing land has not impacted groundwater. So it's very prescribed. The DNR has a number of things that they expect to see visually documented in order to say, yeah, it's feasible. There's a checklist. Part of this part of the feasibility will be a checklist of all the applicable regulations that this is where it's addressed. And in a, how do you what is the technical way to address a, a landscape that could have pockets of karst geology? How do you what is it? Is it like every 15 feet? How do, like for a landscape that has that sort of a topography in it, what's the technical methodology to study and therefore decide? There isn't any bedrock that's permeable. Is it? Like what's I didn't say there wasn't any bedrock that wasn't permeable. I said that bedrock not within 10 feet or unstable. Right. I mean, and that would be a shallower formation that is has cavern geography. There's a there's a specified number of borings that are being that have to be done depending on the 
acreage that we built. In addition to that, we did uh, gamma logging, geophysical logging across all the monitoring wells to understand bedrock horizons of subsurface. I'm just wondering what the increment of distance between those those things are. How many feet? Yeah. It's not based off of feet, it's based on the number of pourings within everything. So that was part of the initial work that was done is putting together the geotechnical investigation report. And that was been approved part of <laughs> that was approved. Do you have a map of those borings that you could send there? It's in the feasibility study. Oh, is it? Yeah. yeah. Everything's in the feasibility study that shows we have it not only in the plan view, but everything will be in, this, I think, about 17, 18, 18 geologic cross section that show the stratigraphy of the subsurface as well as the groundwater. What about an environmental reason that, that would make it not feasible? Presence of endangered resources, impacts to surface water, water quality. I think that has not happened, but. Right, we have not shown that there's that risk. A lot of it is through engineering, right? If you, the premise behind that is that by stalling a subtitle B facility, by the clay, geomembrane, leachate collection, all that stuff, will mitigate any potential risks associated. Yeah. We got the chance to look at uh, the I'm a geologist and uh, environmental scientist, professor emeritus from the University of Chicago, been here 14 years, intensely interested in the geology of the area for personal reasons, because I live about a mile away from uh, the, uh, the, the um, landfill. But it was established, uh, it turns out, according to a, a uh, study that was done in 2003 when, when uh, they were doing a vertical expansion, it turns out that the, the, the geology uh, that was used to establish the, the uh, landfill in the first place was in, enormously erroneous. Filtration rates, uh, hydraulic conductivity rates were tens to hundreds of, of uh, times uh, faster than than uh, than the initial study indicated. So this area is intensely karstic. It is it is very susceptible to uh, to, to some surface collapse. And I don't. How can they possibly say that it, that now it? Uh, in spite of all those data, it is the it is now feasible. Oh. I don't understand. All I can do is is advise you to review the report. Uh, don't you get how fastly and how quickly I can get that report? Um, I would, as soon as we get that out today, then I'll provide an electronic link. I, I, this is going uh, outside of the scope of what we have on our agenda. I, I do have one question. When they when they do the the public hearings, who who does the public? I mean, is this something you're involved in, or yeah, that's the DNR? That's the DNR. The DNR will have representatives to the. Yeah. And they all have answers to all the questions that people have. Uh, Amy Albert sent me a message. Um, she's asking that whoever speak move closer to the mic. Uh, mm -hmm. the, there's been some comments from people online that they cannot hear everyone as they speak. Okay, so. thank you. Yes, I just wanna, um, so the current landfill as it sits, um, when it was originally designed, had one of the first, um, where the leachate was pumped up and over the berm instead of going directly through the initial berm um, within, the, within the landfill. Um, it also has a five foot clay liner um, which code requires four. Um, we have an 18 inch filter of sand protective layer over the over the 60 mil liner when 12 inches is required. So the current landfill was built above spec and I believe we continued that was continued in the design of the expansion, correct? Correct. Um, it will no longer can you hear online? Can you guys hear can people online here, Brian? 
Yes. <laughs> um, it will now utilize a gravel or a, a more permeable uh, material in, for the leachate collection on the bottom. Um, in addition to that, uh, the code requirement says that the liner needs to be sloped at a minimum 1% to your leachate sump. This is designed with a 7. So it'll rapidly drain that liner to the leachate collection system. So that's a few of the things that are in addition to the requirements are. Thank you, Brian. Mm. 2024 budget review. I printed my budget. I just thought that would make it life easier. Um, it's two pages. First one is recycling. Second one is solid waste. There's two all the Okay. What should we get? Can I just talk about it? Yeah. Yep. So if it's not going to be the actual report, you're going to get a link for me. That's understand. Okay. Everybody email me so you can make an assessment with it. I just want to make sure that it's huge. It's kind of strange. Yeah. So there's a, once you have the link to connect, you can have this in the computer. Yes, I will provide Casey an online link to SharePoint site. And if you have problems, because I don't know if I need to establish permissions on my site, or she can download, if you want to create your own site that you can share it wherever you want to. But if you can't access to our link, let me know. And let me know. It's definitely a counter question. <laughs> let me know if I need to provide specific people links to the, the document. Okay. Who holds, where does that document get held? It's in your office? or the, your There's going to be a copy at the landfill office, a physical copy at the landfill office. There'll be a physical copy at the library. There'll be a physical copy at Allen and Roqua. <laughs> There will be one at Vernon County Clerk, um, and then um, obviously there is a whole list of DNR representatives that goes to it goes to each different right. department. Brian, I just have a question, and I don't know if you can answer this or not. And we have a tough decision to make whether to expand or close. Um, if we were to close, what would the process be? Do you? Yeah. Um, you would have to notify the DNR that you intend to close. And I think the requirement is that you have to provide them 90 days notice of when it closes. Um, I, I would encourage you to um, fill it to the capacity to get as much revenue as you could from that at that point. And then you would go through putting together bid specifications to a contractor to close it um, in accordance with the requirements of the closure plan. And our time frame of filling it to capacity is how long? About, About two years. Two years. Year and a half. Okay. But that's on, on volume. that's on existing volume, 2023 volume. So in theory, we should have two and a half to three years with a reduced volume, maybe. Well, even more than that, the way, yeah. I mean. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, like, it's a function of how much waste comes in. And can we feasibly afford? <laughs> To wait that long is what I'm thinking. You know, I I guess I don't know. Yeah, I mean that's there. It, it's a very defined process. It'll take some time to put together the bid documentations, or the bid document, right, for your contractor to do it, and then you know typically if that were to occur, depending on. It's generally probably a two or three month process of construction, depending on how quickly the contractor can to close. To close. So, what what type of work needs to be done then by a contractor to close? Typically, typically, you would need to grade that to final closure grades. You would need to put down what's called a, a grading layer on top of that, um, a gas venting layer, basically. Um, then you would have two feet of clay. Um, come back to do a spec. 
um, a 40 mil geomembrane on top of that, and then um, two and a half feet of redding zone and vegetated. And there would probably be some stormwater, you know, fixes around just to make sure that it's going. Because right now it's an operation. It's not, you know, things aren't in closure mode. <laughs> Parts that are already completed, sort of done to that specs already, or is closure thing that happens to the whole thing? So the, the the present, the like old part that's covered but not the C D site closed. Well, just the parts that are the edges that are well, covered but not closed. Oh yeah, those are an intermediate cover. That's an intermediate cover. So you're talking about this layer, you're talking about the, the entire the, the entire thing gets this treatment. I guess that's why I ask. Is there about that, you know, where's that money going to come from? Because that sounds like a lot That's of work to be done. And it doesn't seem like there's enough money there. My opinion. I don't know what your, what's your long term, what's your worst case closure fund? Um, it's at about $2 million. That should be pretty decent. Yeah, you have to with con you know, you, depends on how many contracts you come in and bid on, right? No matter how hungry people are. Um, but typically closures you're probably looking at about $150,000 to $175,000 a make here. Have you found um, in other cases where they've had to close that the, the DNR's calculations for? These funds that they're setting aside are pretty accurate, or do you feel like there's been a shortfall? Um, there's definitely been shortfalls because really the funding mechanism is depending on who's doing it and how you what your approach is. Like a lot of a lot of private folks will tend to try to minimize their investment in that <clears throat> funded on the backside. Right? They you know, they have kind of two sets of numbers that say. Yeah. This is what required to fund, this is what it's actually going to take, so they're preparing. Um, but in most cases, it's relatively accurate. The DNR has been doing it long enough that they want to make sure that they're not going to get stuck. So, but it's then it really comes down to what you're going to get with respect to the contract. And one thing that I would probably recommend, you know, if you didn't go the closure route, would be to advise the, revise the closure plan to not put an active gas system in. <clears throat> so that isn't a requirement for- That is a currently a requirement. That's assuming the DNR approves. So you want to get an approved here. Study. Which I think there's a solid legal case for it because really not to get too far into the weeds, subtitle D requirements the state of Wisconsin goes above and beyond those requirements, especially as it relates to NR445, which is air emissions. If you're if you are in another state, you don't need to have a gas collection system until your total volume capacity meets 2.5 million cubic meters or cubic tons. You guys are well below that. So it would be an exercise in demonstrating that the emissions related to the landfill would be below the emission standards the state establishes. So We've certainly done that, <clears throat> done that variance at other facilities larger. Um, and then it's just a matter of demonstrating to them that gas migration does not or cannot occur and that anything that comes out is not going to be uh, an emission risk. Yeah. Gas migration is something that we yeah, well, part of it. I mean, the order is, is separate. The, the concern that they're worried about is methane, not necessarily orders. Orders are relatively subjective. Methane is very specific. So um, they'll have standards as to the gas quality of the methane falls in the footprint. It would indicate whether it needs to be active. In other words, it needs to be extracted. And it just... Based on the size of it, I mean, 
it's I've, I've seen it at a number of other sites that are similar in size. They put a gas extraction system in, and it operates for two months, and then the rest of the time it's just idle, like the rust because it can't get it going. And it's probably pretty costly. Yeah. So a long-term care and a capital investment. So I mean, I would encourage you strongly to look at that opportunity to avoid that cost and have the ability to go active as it relates to issues with orders or if uh, you start seeing that migration, which I can't see happening because it's really, it's a clay and jet and plastic line facility. It's going to balloon them. It'll go out past the bands before it will sign oil and burst plastic. Expansion, it would be required to put a gas. Correct. For the closure, you could avoid putting it in. Potentially. Potentially. And the reason that it would be required, you wouldn't necessarily need to have a flare with the expansion, but you would need to actively extract because part of the requirement is you need to have organic stability, and that would probably occur to leach it recirculation. Recirculate leads to enhance the degradation of the waste. So when they when you do that, then they require active extraction, maybe not treatment. If you can demonstrate that the emissions, even though more gas is being produced, it's not a hazard. So I've seen facilities do active and then just emit the methane. Is that a separate expensive study also? Or is that the, the, the is that, land approval? Or this a gas extraction for expansion? Is that already built into your that's already plan? part of it. It's part of the existing design. We have a layout. Um, and I understand this is this step is more of an exercise in the feasibility of it. Environmental, the needs, the geotechnical, well, just to make sure. The next step would be if you chose to go with the expansion, would it be together a plan of operation, which provides the detailed specific phasing details. Question for you on what you just said, the need of it. So where, where did, what, what become of that within this study? Is there a, there a need for it? Yes. Based on? Based on the volume within the region. See, because we don't have anywhere else to go with it, or 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 no, I mean that or, that doesn't take because the reality is is I mean, do you have the volume in the community or your footprint? Because a lot of the to be fair, a lot of the bigger facilities look at it saying, "Hey, I'm just." We're out looking to get as much as we possibly can, right? So what that need does is determine the size of the expansion you can get. Okay. So, I mean, if you have an area that has a waste disposal need, which there is a need every place you can go, there's, there's garbage. It's that, that exercise is more to determine the size how big of an expansion would be. The size, okay. Right? And this, okay. This, this expansion is 427,000 yards. Sure. So, so it doesn't... So it's a necessary exercise the purpose of needing to build it. I'm sure you don't I mean, I mean, it, the, the need is based on, is based for size, like you said, right? The size, right. But, but yeah, that's all right. Okay. I think where our dilemma is coming is GFL moving all their waste to acquire. So what, well, that's why we're asking about 23 numbers or whatever, because projected for 24 is 60 to 70% less, which is where we're struggling. Because everything's projected based on existing volumes, which aren't going to happen prior. Yeah. Well, I mean, and I'll let Stacey you know, that that's, that's not necessarily um, a consideration because what we look at is the overall need within the state 
and there's a shortage of, of volume within the state to handle everybody, and it, as well as the local volume that could potentially happen because we, we focused in on Verdant County to determine per capita how much tonnage or volume would be generated. And I, and I think that's done is that, um, you know, similar to when we, we went through the same process just recently with La Crosse County, is that they have an agreement with Excel Energy, right? That says that a portion of their waste obviously is being directed to Excel to be converted to electricity. But we can't include that in the overall, we have to include that volume that's going to Excel in the overall tonnage capacity because tomorrow Excel could shut down. Um, you know, certainly, Bill, I'm not wishing, you know, but there could be something could happen in the region that would affect the region's ability to manage it. So it has to be assumed what the region's capacity is, whether or not it warrants it. So that's kind of the exercise. So I, we didn't get into the politics or the other discussion side of it, but just about what the, the, the area volume capacity is. We have to decide whether it's economically feasible or not to do this. Mm -hmm. Environmentally, it's been decided. Right, you know. Well, I mean, right. it, it hasn't been decided. We present. No, I mean, but it it will be. It will be. It will be decided. Right. But then the the next half is, we decide whether it's economically viable to do it. Yep. Hey, did you have a question or? I just I just wanted to add that my 2024 <laughs> budget was based on zero volume from GFL. Your budget's already taken out the fact that GFL yeah. is not going to haul it yeah. yet. Yeah. But, and when you, I mean, so with those numbers and your operational experience, how much, how much space do you have left? Uh, well, reducing volume we think and will increase time. Precisely. So, as somebody who right. I don't have a direct, but like year time frame, it depends because my projections are based on population of the municipalities that are being served by haulers that are guaranteeing waste to us. Um, the Darlin Power Project is going on right now. They're bringing lots of material from that facility to ours, which could escalate close being full. Um, so there's a lot of other things that I can't shoot you a, a direct date right now. Our airspace survey is about a year and a half to two years. And that is at 2022 rate volumes. So that, that I just understand that you're like the straight population is not the variable that's going to cause the pain. It's industry. It's you're, you're, you're responsive to an industrial response. So well, for, for example, the 2018 flooding, we took in an entire month's garbage in a week and a half. So things like that could, could yes, they it, it's variable. Helen? Yeah, can I, I asked the last time uh, I was at one of these meetings, what percentage of the, uh, of the uh, waste uh, comes through the land from outside Vernon County? Right now, I don't have a number on that. I'm still collecting data from um, the haulers. Every driver is documenting where it comes from on their tickets. But my understanding is it's about half, about as much comes out of, outside from of Vernon County as comes from Vernon County. Is that about right? I can't speak to that. Right now I'm not. I'm not sure. I am still collecting data from the haulers. Prior to this year when I put a piece of paper on the wall requiring that that be put on tickets, it wasn't. So it was just coming in at MSW, construction demolition, or contracted garbage, and that's the only information I had prior to this year. So right now, I can't answer that for you. I would suggest that that's a critical bit of data because if uh, as much garbage comes to into uh, Vernon County as is generated in Vernon County, uh, we are doing ourselves a very bad service. Can I answer that to a certain extent? Because I yes. kind of towards the end of genes, I know that I, I agree one hundred percent. I mean it's. It's critical to know what's coming in and where it's coming from. And that's something that um, I proposed to Gene a while ago. And I don't recall if I mentioned it to you as well. I know there was a lot of pushback by the haulers. Like, I like, need to know that. And it wasn't given to us. So but we, this is why it's critical. 
in these situations. Yes. It, was, it was quite bad. I think we did, um, I think it was 2018 on the bottoms of the tickets, it was, it says Vernon County and it says non-Vernon County and that was supposed to be circled. So we'd at least have a general Vernon County, non-Vernon County and I could not get compliance. I had drivers tell me they didn't need to do that. Um, this last round, I'm still having issues with compliance and I put this as a requirement, not a request on the door. It's on the scale computer and I still have drivers that aren't putting things on tickets. Like I ask, it just, it's, in theory, they think it's slowing them down, or that that's not information that I'm privy. I should be privy to or need. Um, Is that written in the No, I believe it's in the. I'll have to look. I'm, I don't want to answer if about looking. Not. I would recommend being put in there in the as a as a compliance issue. I like that. Thank you. I, I could just say, Brian, that um, the need is established by the relationship need has to do with an assessment of the population, and that is related to the design of the size, and that's within the primary case scenario. However, if the need assessment is actually related to the data with content and bringing services, is absorbing so that's why I'm absorbing need that actually extends to Vernon County's need. For instruction. Then we are, uh, then you guys will decide to start ultimately as approving a landfill that will, will serve a need of the state and not just serve a need of Vernon County. That's, that's what I mean. That's, that seems like there's a, I mean, oh, sorry, right. a, a, right. indirectly serving a need of. Because everything that comes here here is not going someplace else. So that's how it affects the overall volume of the state. The big choice for Vernon County. Make as a as a, for a county that originally we got into this because they the older picture the political Verdon County boundary was opened sometime during 2018 during the contract negotiations as a request of the haulers because we were seeing only Vernon County garbage and it was brought up that we were making liars of them because they were bringing stuff from out of county so that was opened up in 2018 at the request of the haulers being you know because there isn't one hauler that just operates in vernon county even some of the smaller ones um broaden out are broadening out outside of vernon county so that was that's why that was done um, but you know, we we theoretically couldn't expect the haulers to turn around at the county line and Head someplace else and come back at the county line and finish their route. I know that. So, I know that presentation. I'm just questioning the premise of the county's operation, operating a landfill for the purposes of far beyond Vernon County's boundaries, potentially far beyond Vernon County's boundaries. Because ultimately, the game of the game of the, of the black, of being in the black has to do with in with flow and revenue. The only way that's going to happen is if we would get excessively cheap as compared to other disposal sites. And that's a game you'll play for a long time into the future if you expand. Hey, that's back in the budget. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, you had a question? No, I just wanted to make sure that nobody else, because I was going to. Take off of my century. I think it's a beat up on you. <laughs> no, I, I yeah. Yes, thank you. Very you guys are faced with some tough decisions. I would please feel free to give me a call if you have any questions. Oh. Then the, the technical side of so. Okay. Thank you very much. Let's say goodbye. Thank you, Brian. Okay, so my recycling budget is bottom line is $352,500. Um, it balances on the recycling side of things. Um, the reason it increased is primarily due to the increase in tire recycling. Both our tipping fee will be charging as well as the expense associated with that. Um, and and coal, the COLA increases significantly increase the budget. Um, Otherwise, I mean, do you guys want me to go through each line item? I don't know how in depth or you want me to get on the recycling side of things. 
<clears throat> what do you expect to be the major changes i guess it would be what i would be interested in recycling um recycling side of things i'm looking forward to better use of our pup trailer reducing uh need for reducing staffing and fuel um right now we are utilizing it we use utilize it a lot in spring cleanup um it's been kind of sitting idle this summer um if i had another dumpster or two set up for recycling we may be able to do two recycling trips at once i just have to get the dumpster and the setup and uh that costs additional money <laughs> so um trying to figure out how to utilize that piece of equipment that much more efficiently i'm looking forward to that um i am looking forward to a potential um partnership with the village of cashton um regarding they may start bringing us their recycling as well um they haul all their own material um so I'm looking forward to that. Um, that would increase volume and potentially sale of recycling revenue. Um, otherwise, recycling, the markets are still all over the place. Um, and they, are, they always will be, it's a commodity. So um, trying to budget for that. Otherwise, I don't really have any other changes. Maybe, um, you know, like I'm excited about the fair this year. We're going to be having a recycling program at the fair. We tried to do it a few years ago and it was a total nightmare. Um, but I'm hoping this year we'll be able to kind of get more involved in some of the community events and help provide recycling services and things that, you know, outreach. So you say you're going to go with Ashton for recycling, it's recycling only? Uh, they are going to be bringing it to us. Um, I, I don't know about their garbage yet because they're in Monroe County mm -hmm. um, and they want they want to support their local facility, um, their local landfill, the Monroe County one. Um, it's but just like everywhere else in the world, it's coming down to cost and trying to truck it to Monroe County. We're a little bit closer and the roads are better. They said the roads are beating the living crap out of their truck. Um, so they may be interested in signing or setting up the rebate program. Um, They've got a state ID tall, um, so that may be another source of volume that is not included in this budget because it's not a done deal yet. But um, I guess I was more curious if they do like the one cycling day. They they do. So the village of Cashin operates a drop off center just like the rest of just like our townships do, um, and they have a wonderful facility down there. Um, and they take everything. They take all the electronics, bulbs. Um, they bail their own cardboard. They. Um, they have their own dumpsters, a hook truck, like they, they went all in and it's a very nice facility and they went to referendum. They were talking about giving curbside um, in the village of Cashin and it was voted down by their constituents. So um, they were just looking because of the, the fire that happened in Columbia County that torched that material recovery facility. Um, their costs went through the roof because Monroe County and surrounding places that you utilize that facility started scrambling trying to find a home for their recycling. So that's why they reached out to me and I was like, well, we don't charge for recycling, but it has to be sorted. That's right now, that's our policy. We don't charge anything for any of the regular recyclables and if they're and they're brought in sorted. So they were gonna make efforts to do that to try to save save money. The bottom line is it's not gonna cost us anything. No, they'll truck it to us. The only um the only thing we'll have in it is bailing, you know, bailing the plastic and the paper. Um but we do that for all of our other municipalities and things. So it would just be incorporated with the current volumes we bail and I have a question in your recycling budget, okay. your tipping fee. Yep. Okay, so who's charged the tipping fee for recycling? So the tipping fees are for things like appliances, tires, the electronics. Um, so that would be the townships, residential drop off of these things. And the reason that increase is because of tires, the increase in tires. I guess that's part of lead in from what I was asking is so the cash and recycles and they're bringing in tires and all this other. They would be paying those tipping fees. Okay. Yeah, that stuff's not free to anybody. Okay, you said it was free. <laughs> Village of yeah. Cash, and like, so for mattresses for the town of Viroqua, if they bring me a mattress, I charge the townships 15. I give the townships our cost. Where if 
if Phil himself brought a mattress, then I charge him forty. No, I'm just kidding. I charge him twenty. Is what our our tipping fee is. So, so the townships for both mattresses and tires, we do give them our cost. Trying to work with our town, our our municipalities. Um, but the village of Cash, you know, if they bring that stuff, they're going to get charged the same rate as like Phil resident because they're not part of Vernon County. They're not part of that responsible unit. They're outside of our. <coughs> Any other stuff on the recycling side? I think it does need to be stressed that this was put together without any contributions from GFL. And we don't receive any, especially on the recycling side, but the solid waste side, we, I, I mean, I sent you guys my additional information. Um, yeah, we, the, and the numbers I use based on the population projections are prior to 2018 volumes that vernon county itself generated um trying to get to the most accurate mo the closest number i could okay so in your budgeting process you used a projection based on vernon county population yes. correct right. but how much of that percentage of the population and revenue are we going to lose next year the, okay, that, so that I sent you guys an additional budget worksheet, and in that worksheet, um, it showed the po it showed the municipalities that have MOUs, who their haulers are, their populations, and then I took to try to get so I can use a state garbage generation rate of four point whatever pounds, but we were concerned, you know, with residents you know, potentially not using the town dump or whatever um, other outlying circumstances there could be, I took prior usage in Vernon County generation and broke it down to a per person what we used to generate prior to all the influx of out of county garbage and used that generation number. And I think it was like three pounds per person. And that's how I calculated my tonnage for the solid waste side of things because i it just don't seem to add up because actual tonnage is going away so let's use some ton rather than this population figuring stuff why don't we just use because i can't quantify the tonnage right now because right now as i stated in the email when i sent the budget out our area is going undergoing huge transition right now and trying to quantify what we will lose over what we are going to start seeing because people are switching different haulers and working with haulers that will bring garbage to us. I, I can't quantify that because I don't have any data to give you to quantify that right now as we sit here. Well, if I'm looking at the tipping fees, you've only got 100000 less than you had this year. Oh, and yes. if you say 70%, it's going to be taken away. Doesn't add up. That, that doesn't Yes, but that 70% number is years prior. We have a new hauler operating in our area that is gaining momentum. We have other haulers coming into our area that are willing to work with us. Those are the outlying things that I can't quantify for you right now because they're happening as we are all sitting in this chair today. Right. I can't quantify that. Okay, so and another thing we can't account for is the cost of this none of that that expansion is in here because don't, we don't know if we're going to be expanding it. right but i mean so it's it's kind of like uh, i think the only good part is volume wise we've got more time than what we thought i mean right in general thinking mm -hmm. so maybe we're better off to give it six months into next year and then we're going to be able to get some better exact numbers on what we're getting. This is something we're going to continue to monitor as 2024 goes on. Right. Um, we, we did meet twice on this budget. I can say as far as uh, the department head budgets that we put together, this was more one of the more um, complicated ones as far as estimations because we are losing the tonnage from GFL. I did have CC come back and present a, a new budget to me that, that pulled out any tonnage from GFL. Um, so that when we came to committee level to discuss it, that 
you know, we have an estimation for you. That's all it is, is an estimation. We can't, because the decision has not been made as far as expansion or closure, obviously it's this budget, one way or another, it's going to change. Um, but where we're sitting right now with the information that we have, it's a, a conservative estimate as far as tonnage goes from those municipalities that um, have signed the MOUs. Um, I did, and that is, I had requested that Stacy send those budget worksheets out to you prior so that you could review and see basically how, how we came up with those numbers. Um, but it is something that we are, are going to be keeping track of. And if we get a few months into the year and, and our tonnage is, we're going to have some serious discussions about adjustments that we're going to have to make on the expenditure side of it, whether that's uh, staffing, you know, equipment, um, what that might be as far as continuing to, to operate. Um, with a, a significant change in the revenue. And there's going to have to be a significant change in the fee. That is also, um, and actually Brian, I had uh, with Brian before this meeting, and that's something that um, he brought up as well, is that, you know, looking at increasing our tipping fees. Um, that yeah. obviously makes us less competitive when you have callers and people whether they're going to bring their government here or LaCroix County. Um, but it is a way to, you know, to help make some revenue off that. But in your letter, didn't you say they were going to get a rebate if they signed on with us? If we, once the rebate program comes, gets approved, I have Nikki looking at it currently. Um, re in, it's in review with her before it's brought here. I did, I did factor in a full 9% rebate for all of the tonnage that was contracted on this budget. See, the thing but that then if you're talking... <laughs> you know, in two months, we may have to increase that, and they're going to be held to that 9%. But what you're not looking but, at is the GFL was 7% of our tonnage. Right. There was a lot of tonnage coming out of the townships that was going to GFL that is no longer going to GFL that we've signed, that they have signed their letters that is going to be coming to Vernon County. So we are not going to be losing 70%. Right, but the thing that gets me is I have a county chair and I have a town seat. And in our township, we're, we're actually spending more. And then going into this budget, if things don't work out right and everything else, it's actually going to cost us more when before it was costing us a lot less. That's the problem I have. Because that MOU is signed and... And, and it's it's it costs us more to sign it. And then if things don't work out here, it's going to cost us more yet. And we don't know how much that is. Because nobody knows nothing. And then what do we do? Do we have to put that on the, you know, the... the um, That's what upsets me with this. Nobody knows nothing. We don't... Well, and what, and what we, is, have, we, also, we also have to... You also have to think about, okay, people are upset with garbage coming in from outside of Vernon County, but the problem is, is it has to come in because tonnage equals revenue. You need revenue to operate. So you need all the tonnage you can get to operate. So if we're going to build a landfill and we're going to say, no, we only want to consume the garbage that's produced in Vernon County, that, that's ridiculous. So the city of Roqua was going to put out for bids, if I remember right, um, for... Garbage. That was my understanding. Yes. Have you seen anything? I haven't. I I was told I was going to be on their agenda tonight, and it, it's not on their meeting. Um, I'm going to the town of Hillsboro tonight, um, and I've been talking to a couple of council members. Um, I know when I talked to the mayor before, he just said, "Well, we haven't heard anything," but I hadn't heard anything from GFL or anybody else either. So now I saw it that somewhere it's on the agenda there was supposed to be that was going to be brought up, but under that discussion. They were saying, well, we need a price. So what price would you give them for ton? I wouldn't be bidding it. Well, no, but they're going to want to know if, if, if they want to haul it to Vernon County Landfill, that'll affect the rate of the hauler. So they're going to need to know base price. And I, I know it's, it's a mix, but that's, that's the struggle they're having is they want a price. We're not able to. Nobody's doing anything. You're saying it's a hauler. Well, the hauler can't give them a price till they know what it's going to cost them to haul it to the landfill. 
Yeah, a hauler like that isn't going to enter into a contract where the price is going to be variable and it's going to change like we did with that MOU. Right. That's, well, that's what I'm saying. Is we don't know, you know, and I don't know where that lined up, but that's I can see their dilemma because right. how do you? I wouldn't sign a contract for something. That, and also, as as the person running the department, how am I supposed to set a price when I can't I'm not, tell you? I'm not saying. That. I'm, gonna, I'm just saying, saying from, so, from their perspective. I understand. I'm saying that. That's a struggle, and with these MOUs, how much kickback are we going to get if all of a sudden the price goes up? So what's the what's getting... the guarantee from other haulers? Also, well, I mean, there isn't. That, that's, that's what I'm. You know, it's no different right. with Vernon County landfill than it is with any of the other ones. The other ones have had triple increases that they've had. I guess I look at this. I always think that government entities should not be in competition. With private entity entity, I mean, I just, I just don't think it. Martha, why did you haul your garage to our landfill instead of someplace else? Well, obviously, because I am a resident here, and I can take it there, and I enjoy having it open. But I have to look at the full picture of my constituents, what they want, and the cost. I mean. I'll have to pay the cost just like everyone else if we close, but how do I know that it's going to not be the same price or even less going with GFL or, or someone else? Or really high. In, well, you know. what, but what are we going to do, you know, then are we going to put the garbage portion of this on the tax roll and put it on everybody's property tax? Because either way, it's going to go up. There's no doubt about it. I well, don't know. It has to. It has to, to make it to make it work. Right. That's my two cents. I and I'm not to put you on the defensive. I know you're only doing your job, but we've got to look at the big picture here too for everyone in Brigham County, and that's why we were elected to look at. So, based on your numbers, how much tonnage would an average family have in a year? One. At the average person, based on the read I came to from Vernon County, is about half a ton a year. Per person. Per person. Well, ton to two tons. Even if it went up $40 a year, it doesn't help much for a family. <clears throat> Looking at it that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we keep talking big numbers under tonnage, but in all reality, for a family of three, if it doubled, it would go up three dollars a month, or I mean, at a high end. I'm just looking at perspective. I'm not. You saying that on the tax? If it was put on the tax roll? No, I'm just saying top cost wise. So if we're looking at it for the average family. We call, if we close the landfill and then go something else, the price goes up 50%. <clears throat> Over a year's time, it's not going to be much when you look at what your tonnage is. And I don't know what the rates are and pickup costs and whatever else. I'm just saying buy that. So if you're paying $20 a year now, doubled, you pay 40 Well, that's still 5 bucks a month. The way people spend money is that... <laughs> I would say respectively, our township generates anywhere from possibly four to five ton a week. The whole township. If I if I remember right on our figures, correct me if I'm wrong, Bill, you might know roughly a weekly four and a half to five ton, because respectively in one of those dumpsters, can you get three ton in one? No. You know, two and a half to three. So two go out every week, I'd say, say five ton a week times, you know. Right. So that's, and we're a pretty big, pretty big township. Mm -hmm. Per cap, you know, Hamburg, 
I mean, resident wise, we're pretty large. Looking at it from an economic development standpoint, we have a $1.2 million budget. And the, what would what would any county do, any economic development committee do to bring in a $1.2 million business into their into their vicinity? Because if we don't have our $1.2 million business, if you want to look at it as a business, if we don't have this $1.2 million business in our township, we might as well take $1.2 million, put it in an envelope, and send it out of the county. There goes your jobs. There goes the whole infrastructure for it. Oh, we're losing this is, money this year. What's that? Oh, we're losing money this year. Why don't you take that $1.2 million then and support a business within the county? We don't have the $1.2 million. We've shipped it out. It's gone. We're no longer supporting our local businessmen fixing our trucks. We don't have our employees out there. We don't have spring and fall cleanups. We have no place to bring our refrigerators for the prices that we get for that. We that's a different start. budget. That's a that's not a solid waste budget. That's a different budget. Don't throw that in there. Don't say you're not going to have the recycling because of solid waste. Because Are you going that, to be able to get know. rid of your recycling at no cost if that goes away out there? Well, then, Lauren, that should be reflected within the recycling budget. If it isn't feasible to do that, then maybe we shouldn't be in the business of doing that either. But that's the case. So if you have one supporting the other, the other is supporting the other one, it, 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 it shouldn't work that way. It's separate. The recycling is separate from solid waste. We're talking about solid waste here, right? Tonnage, mm -hmm. all that. We're not talking, you just threw a little bit of recycling in there. You can't, you can't do that. Recycling is separate. You get a hundred, you're projected to get what? A hundred and fifty thousand, seven thousand five hundred dollars in state funding for recycling, right? So that's what's paying for your, your recycling days and, and all that. Solid waste shouldn't. And in some instances, that's been the case. Solid waste has been in the past somewhat subsidizing recycling because if there's a shortfall or not, am I, am I correct? They're all under the solid waste and recycling department budget. The, the, the way that they're cooperative is staffing are split between the two departments where, you know, like my salary, I'm administrative. I, okay, I, I'm I get that, but they're the still, they're still separate. <laughs> they're still separate, Bobby, right? They're still two different budgets, right? They are still two different. Granted, they may utilize the same facility and, and other things like that, but they're two separate budgets. Funding. Historically, you got to bring that up. Has solid waste subsidized recycling in the past, Bobby? Okay, okay, you're, yeah, I got gotcha. you. I, I know, I know, that, that's another thing, is that, that there, so. Martha has brought up the fact that we have to do what our constituents want. Um, you, you bring up closing that twice, and you're going to get tired and feathered is all I'm saying. Well, I'm talking town of Barocca. I don't know what town Talk of Barocca. outside of the really. town of Barocca. I've got two emails from citizens from the town of Barocca that want to know what's going on, what they can start doing to bring the truth to the people. Well, and show them the budgets. <laughs> well, right. Like I said, my township... We, we, we by signing that MOU. Which, by signing that MOU, you guaranteed that you're going to be paying five dollars a ton more instead of fifteen dollars a ton more in a year and a half. You bought yourself a really good insurance policy, is what you did. I don't know about that. I, I don't. I don't know about that. How can you say that? How because can you not say that because we had a, a, a we we would have got a three year contract for less money. It cost us less for three years. And then. Then you go through the process of rebidding again, and it rebidding with and, no competition. 
Well, I don't know. I think it. I think. I think, I think competition has been created. Okay. I mean, well, they just added another hauler, didn't you? Yes. I mean, there's kind of can't. Well, and and the other part of it is, and I, I guess I'm not decided one way or the other. It's going to depend on how much money the the rest of the budget has to, if the general fund has to fund part of it to keep it going. You know, we're we're throwing out numbers. We're doing all this. If the people are paying it with their tax dollar versus with something else, it's still costing the taxpayer. So but we don't know what the answer to that is. And has yeah. Town of Viroqua decided whether they even want to continue? Pardon? Wasn't Town of Viroqua? Isn't there a, I mean, more than sign in? Right. I mean, as far as even the expansion, doesn't Town of Viroqua have a say in that if they? Obviously not. They don't, it, it's not whether or not we expand. This town host agreement is not whether or not we expand. It is if we expand the uh, operational request of the town of Viroqua. And if we can't come to an agreement, it will go to arbitration of the state and the state will draw up an agreement and be like, here is your agreement. It's, it is not the town of, it's not only the town of Viroqua's decision to close or expand. Like that's, that's okay. not what that is. Okay. Yeah, that's just if we do what, you know, because they are like people that live next to the landfill, things like that, you know, like the litter, the odor, you know, traffic. That's what that's for, not their decision on whether we expand or not. That's not the purpose of that agreement. I mean, the, the problem I have with the solid waste budget proposal here is, you know, the requested budget from for 24 versus the you know, revised budget of 23, you know, the tipping fee, that's, that's your revenue, that's your tonnage, mm -hmm. that that's a difference of $100,000. Now, if we use $57 and 50 cents a ton, as a calculation, that's only a difference of um, 1739 ton, that that doesn't make sense to me. So the numbers that I sent you guys, there is additional revenue that's included in that. So um, there is the contracted, the contracted volumes, which would represent in theory all of the municipalities, but there's also permitted rate of 65 a ton. So you're not taking that entire volume divided by the contract. It is a majority of it, yes. But I reduced the tonnage for the contract, um, the contracted volumes down to down to ten thousand, or excuse me, down to eleven thousand ton. And right now we're sitting at like eighteen to twenty thousand ton. They're, the permitted haulers are paying more, residential drop-offs are paying more, um, special ways, things like asbestos, deer carcass, that's all charged at a higher rate. Um, beneficial use material is at a lesser rate. Um, and then the minimum drop charges from residents dropping stuff off is also included in that tipping fee. So that's not just straight tonnage volume. My understanding that this budget reflects the most accurate scenario that you we can come up with for the next year. With the information that we have available, this is the most accurate numbers that we could come up with, you know, forecasting into the next year. It could be much better, it could be worse. And that's the way it is with any budget plant your corn and end up chopping it all or don't you want the same what the numbers that you hope for or the actual numbers we have right now that's the same so and we did reduce it you said 11 well from 
Yeah, I've, I've reduced the, the tonnage. tonnage down to 11 ton or 110,000 ton, whatever that number is. It's 11,000. 11,000 ton. And we have reduced it, and that's coming from the basically guaranteed garbage coming in. Bobby? Just like to remind you that this is just the review of the initial proposed budget. This will then go to finance in October. In October, it will go to the county board in public hearing first. So we have until November, if something should change between now and then, to make any changes. So we can continue to monitor progress through 2023 and see how we go for the rest of this year. And then if something does need to change, we can always bring it back for the special infrastructure, or special finance, or county board meetings. So we do have a little bit of time yet. Based on what we know today, this is what was developed and we're comfortable with being forward. Well, you should have two months of data from your people that signed your MOUs then to see what amount of tonnage they are delivering in a two, two month. And you're not going to have your holiday season in there where a lot of a little more tonnage is generated over the holiday season and everything from the packaging and all this and that. And, you know, you're not going to have the springtime cleanup and if somebody's doing spring cleaning. So it's going to be kind of your run of the mill, you know, time of year. So I would think you'd be able to collect some data and then just kind of figure that on a year's basis for figuring and, and to the advantage of the budget it would be low right you know on the revenue side to the budget's advantage and and it would give us i think a better idea than right. of what what is actually oh, you know going to be coming in and anything over and above that is is a plus there rather than using this population and everything else and because that that this is don't that don't work that that don't work i can pull tonnage reports per hauler but I, what i'm right now which is again why i'm saying i can't give you data i can print reports all day the data right now is not sufficient as to what's going on in our area the transitional difference i the data that i have in my computer is not reflective of what's happening right now how many emily because it's all will point well no will. You're gonna, i'm saying you're gonna have two months of at least two if not two and a half to three months of be able to see a trend mm -hmm. yes. you're talking january february right no, I'm, well, no, I'm like talking real time right now, now. Right now. Now. So now until basically. Yeah. You'll have August, September, oh, okay. October. Actual. Actual. But how many are hauling to you now that. Uh, how many are hauling to you now, but then how many more would be hauling to you after the first? So that's what I'm saying. Because the, oh, the bill is still with us right now. Well, we don't know what the city's going to do yet. That's right. right. But so that that's and and in this budget, anybody that did sign an MOU that is still currently utilizing GFL, we didn't include those volumes either because they stated they would not be hauling us anything after the first. So those communities that even though they did pass the MOU, we removed that volume off of this budget as it is already. Or if you use population, what who do you bite us out of there? I'm sorry, say that again. If you use population for numbers. The municipalities like that. Oakwa, yeah. Amish, some of the Amish. How do you, that, that I, population number is pretty vague. That isn't a. It's the general population that the county. Our county. Yeah. Um, broke down by the municipalities. And then anybody that even anybody that signed an MOU, I had originally included. Well, then we went back and took everybody that did sign an MOU that is still currently having GFO haul their waste. We removed all that volume too, just to try to get a more accurate picture. But that's why I went back and used historical Vernon County tonnage prior to all the out of county waste to try to get a better picture, you know, because of 
you know, the people that don't utilize the town dump, they have their own dumpster that's being provided by GFL, whatever their circumstances are. Trying the to reports get it terrible, which they are. But like Kyle said, you just to look back at who signed and what's coming in. That's just pretty straightforward, actual tonnage. Yes. Of looking okay. back and crisscrossing this and minusing out these people. Actual data, real time data. So, how many MO users still hanging out there that you never got an answer? Or how many said no? Or how many said yeah? I have one that just flat out said no. I was Town of Liberty. I've got one, two, three, four townships. Moon Valley still waiting on their their legal team desoto Genoa, i've not contacted um village of stoddard is still pending um and i have not reached out to the city of hillsborough i'm pretty confident that will be a no and the city of Roqua is still pending problem i have with the mous is that those mous and and what what Stacy pitched to them for cost of tonnage. There is no reflection of the the expansion or anything in in there. So those that signed the MOU based on, let's say if it was a little bit of a difference, and they felt it was good for them to sign and support that MOU, that down the road they, they have no idea we have no idea of what it's going to cost exactly. everyone to do this that's the problem and now they've all signed on and but you if you wouldn't have signed it you had every every confidence that it was going to you know stay that way forever and be cheaper without any insurance that we i'm not i'm not saying so that. I, what i'm asking kyle is why are you ripping on vernon county for not having all the definite answers when no one else has any definite answers either. No, I, ju I just feel that if 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 we have to substantially increase the amount that it's going to take for those people to get rid of their garbage, I increase the tipping fee. Vernon County is going to get one big black eye. Bobby and I put together volume projections per your request. We submitted those earlier and presented those to you guys showing worst case, you know, middle of the road case. And that was kind of why we started doing the MOUs is trying to guarantee volume so we could establish pricing. Bobby, is that not what we worked on? Yeah, so we, I mean, we did that, but now we got to hit the volume mark to get to those numbers. And that did include the cost of construction. The only the only new cost that, that those numbers didn't include was the potential replacement of the compactor because that's going to have to be replaced. So that's the only thing that that didn't include and we had different volume projections that's why we did those numbers that way so you guys had a different picture of like if we only get this tonnage this will be the tipping fee if we get this tonnage here's your tipping fee so those numbers have been presented and calculated and it wasn't just me making stuff up bobby was also with me working on this stuff um so the biggest variable is Mm -hmm. Right. Well, that's what, we can that's adjust, our whole discussion. We can adjust tipping fees all day long. The biggest question is whether or not the tonnage comes in. Right. And then how can we, I guess, how can we realistically say we'll give them a rebate if we don't know what the costs are going to be? The rebate for, at least for the town, the municipalities that read the MOU rebate, I think was reflected like $20,000. Because based on the volumes, and I, and I did a $2 per ton rebate trying to, I don't know, make it so it was at least something back. Um, yeah, it resulted in $20,197 based on the MOU tonnages. Um, the 9% contract rebate, that is just a projection that is a, not even, we can reduce that percentage, but rebating haulers back might incentivize some of the other haulers to come into our area and continue to compete and work with our system instead of just taking the stuff out that's how lacrosse county does it and it's based on length of term so 
if you only want to sign on for one year, well, then the rebate would be 2%. You don't get the 9% if you don't want to work with our program long term. If you sign on for five years, then you get the 9%. It helps competition. It helps promote people working with our our system instead of trying to fight it and work outside of it. Are you locking in a rate then for the full five years? Or is that so variable based on the unknown? Like La Crosse County, I don't know that theirs has a set rate. It's it, their their tipping rate, I believe, is set annually, and and our our Vernon County has had a tipping rate of sixty dollars per ton until two thousand eighteen. I raised the permitted fee to sixty five because we were competing with the haulers, so I raised it to sixty five. So now anybody that doesn't have a contract and just signs up for the permit is paying sixty five. That's the only rate increase that this department has had since two thousand eight. And it was a five dollars. And if you look at the state tipping fee, it's on the DPR website. If you look at some of the tipping fees for some of the other facilities, we're low. We're 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 low. Cost to run these facilities is not cheap, and it's not going to get cheap. So your costs are going to go up no matter what. So this and, way, like, we're, and we're that's what we're getting. At. That's what we're getting at with but, this. But with the count having the county in control of that, you guys are able to actually control some of the disposal side of side costs staffing you guys dictate what my i pay my staff you know if we're losing volume well then fuel will decrease because we won't need to fire up the compactor or drive stuff around i mean there's there's a lot of variables in this stuff and i understand the economies of scale and things but having your guys's own control over how we dispose of material and what we dispose of gives you guys a little more leverage as opposed to just going hands up disposal costs will be what they'll be and and having it go privatize and we don't have any control of anything other than just the bid spec that you put out. The cost for everybody is about the same. Your compactors cost money, it cost money to truck it there, your trucks cost money. But, but so if you're operating a, an op, like not for profit, your rates can be cheaper if you're not going for a profit, but which we're not going for profit. So if a hauler signs in for five years, you didn't answer the question. Is it a set price or will it change every year? I don't have that stipulated. I don't have a set price stipulated in the current rebate program. I don't have a set rate in there because I don't know. Well, doesn't really matter. I have a small dumpster from GFL and they do offer a contract option. So far, the cheapest outside one of our other haulers is $100 more a year. GFL is cheaper for my personal, personal dumpster at the moment. And so what it did is it create a competition, Paul, correct? Right. So it's a, it's a, it's, it's my money for that dumpster. So I don't know. Yeah. I was surprised that none of these other haulers that hauled to our landfill, it was still, it was a hundred or more to service my Per year. And, and again, over the course of the year, that's just a few dollars. Support, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But it is my cheaper, cheaper energy. Because they have competition also, <laughs> and not just us. <laughs> but I think bottom line, it's where we're at is let's wait, get the numbers so we can get a better picture of where we're at because it's too big a decision to base on what ifs. And that's what all these conversations have been or what Got to head out. Sure. Okay. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Budget, it is what it is. It's additive. Yeah, sure. It, it seems like you're shooting for what is the lowest tonnage number that you can operate a landfill and be solvent, which I mean, solvent in this nonprofit sort of way, which seems like a tricky, a tricky dart to throw. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because all landfills have these costs. So any landfill that's bigger than our landfill is paying for compactors, paying for staff, paying for all these things. And they're just spreading that out over a bigger landfill. Mm -hmm. A bigger 
Anyone have anything I mean, more to just, add? Or? Just information, so I guess yeah. we kind of beat it. Guess we could talk yeah. in circles all day. Yeah. I mean, it's until we have better numbers, I don't know if we can make a fair decision. think so either all right so i guess we'll review next month again um any more discussion on this